In the last couple of years, reactivity has been the hot topic of the front-end world. After years of fighting amongst themselves on Twitter, all of the framework creators are coming to an agreement on the topic. Except one. In order to get to the details, we need to first start with the definition. Let's first define what we are talking about. And no, it's not something easy like chemistry, biology or psychology. We are dealing with something much more trickier. Front-end development. Firstly, we need to understand the problem that reactivity addresses. When the first front-end frameworks were introduced, they solved two very important issues. They enhanced user experience by creating websites that were dynamic, highly interactive and performed like native apps. On the other hand, they also improved developer experience, empowering developers to create such sophisticated applications. Reactivity sits at the core of these frameworks playing a crucial role for both developer experience and user experience. It ensures that updates to the UI happen automatically without developers needing to manually rewrite code each time. In its simplest form, Mark of Frontend Masters describes reactivity as Reactivity is how systems react to changes in data. When data changes, you do things. Expanding on this, the view documentation defines reactivity as a programming paradigm that allows us to adjust to changes in a declarative manner. The declarative part is quite important and explained well in the reactive programming as a general programming paradigm. For example, in an imperative programming setting, A equals B plus C would mean that A is being assigned the result of B plus C in the instant the expression is evaluated, and later the values of B and C can be changed with no effect on the value of A. Now. Imagine instead a special destiny operator. In reactive programming, using the destiny operator, we would write A destiny B plus C. This means that the value of A is automatically updated whenever the values of B or C change, without needing to explicitly repeat the assignment A equals B plus C each time those values adjust. Now, how do we implement reactivity in vanilla JavaScript? You can make a single property reactive using object-defined property, setting up getters and setters to execute code when a property is addressed or modified. You can also handle reactivity for the entire object using proxy. A proxy allows you to modify the implementation of the object using handler functions, known as traps, presumably because they trap calls to the object. Or reactivity can be implemented using an event emitter, where you listen for changes and update the UI in response. There are many ways and strategies to achieve this using vanilla JavaScript, and Mark's article provides great insights into different techniques. Let's rewind to 2010, when within a span of three months, three popular frameworks emerged, each offering distinct versions of reactivity. First came Knockout, introducing initially two concepts, observable for state and computed for side effects. And later, they introduced a third concept, pure computed for derived state. Backbone's reactivity was more similar to the event-based example we saw in vanilla JavaScript. The framework used the model view architecture, where models, which represent the data, and views, which represent the UI, are separate but interconnected components. Models emit events when their attributes change, and views listen to these events to update the UI manually. Angular introduced data binding automating much of the DOM updates and data synchronization through a digest cycle, a loop that monitors changes in watch variables and updates the view whenever a change is detected. However, if not used carefully, Angular was prone to performance issues due to extensive monitoring of data changes. The patterns often felt clunky, either derived from server-side models like MVC or from older jQuery practices. Moreover, misusing these powerful but flawed techniques often became a food gun. React introduced a solution to these issues with its unidirectional data flow and virtual DOM. Every time there is a change in state, a new virtual DOM is created and compared with the previous one. Then, only the necessary changes are applied to the UI. This method makes it clear what triggers an update, what the results of the update are, and how they are applied. But wait a second. We've discussed reactive patterns in vanilla JavaScript that update precisely the needed element. Now we are moving to these dirty checking systems. Are these even truly reactive? There have been many articles about how React isn't reactive, even by their own standard. Angular is further from that. This is why, in order to keep everyone on the same topic, 
we introduce a spectrum, or a dimension of reactivity, ranging from coarse to fine-grained. It goes like this. Coarse-grained means the framework has to execute a lot of application or framework code to determine which DOM nodes need to be updated. Fine-grained means the framework does not need to execute any code and knows exactly which DOM nodes need to be updated. There are trade-offs to each solution between performance and ease of use. I will let you guess which site is preferred by us, WebDev. Vue quickly became popular for its intuitive and efficient reactive system. When you assign a plain JavaScript object to a Vue's instance as its data option, Vue.js processes all its properties and converts them into getters and setters using object-defined property. These getters and setters help Vue.js track and notify changes. Each directive or data binding is linked to a watcher that monitors touched properties. When activated, the setter prompts the watcher to update the DOM. Reactivity in Svelte was achieved through reactive assignments. When the state, a variable, of a component was updated, Svelte would automatically rerun the component's code to reflect the changes in the DOM. Unlike frameworks like React, Svelte 1.0 didn't use a virtual DOM. Instead, it compiled components into highly efficient imperative code that directly updated the DOM. This means that Svelte could make updates very quickly and efficiently. SolidJS, in a way, brings us full circle to the early days of reactive frameworks like KnockoutJS, especially through its use of signals for state management. Signals in SolidJS are a pair of getter-setter functions that manage reactive states. When a signal value is accessed, SolidJS tracks the current function as a dependency. Upon updating the signal, SolidJS efficiently triggers updates only in the functions or components that depend on this changed state. This leads to more targeted and efficient UI updates. The combination of simple reactive primitives and compile time optimizations in SolidJS makes it highly performant. My website is slow, but it's not my fault. One point of view that I found really interesting was mentioned by Mishko in his front-end master's course. The speed of light is roughly 300,000 km per second. The speed of an electrical signal in silicon ranges between one-third and one-tenth of the speed of light. Let's say it's one-fifth for simpler calculations. This means that the signal in the CPU travels at 60,000 km per second. To achieve a CPU speed of 3 GHz, the signal needs to travel the distance 3 billion times in a second. This implies that the maximum distance the signal can travel in a CPU is about 2 cm. Today's CPUs are around 3.5 cm. Most improvements in CPU performance over the last decade have come from adding more cores. But since the V8 engine JavaScript execution is single-threaded, it doesn't fully benefit from these additional cores. So to enhance performance, we need to focus on improving the code itself. This need for better performance is driving major changes across popular frameworks. In 2019, Svelte retaught its approach to reactivity, moving from manual state setting to a system that compiles and abstracts reactivity. Recently, with applications growing more complex, Svelte has shifted its emphasis to signals to better manage reactive state. Similarly, Angular is evolving to become more performant by using signals. This transition aims to shift Angular from a coarse-grained, zone.js dependent, dirty checking framework to a more modern, fine-grained system. Vue has also recognized that the virtual DOM is not the most efficient approach and is shifting to Vapor, a new compilation strategy that eliminates the use of virtual DOM. React, while not adopting signals, has acknowledged the need for performance enhancements. After initially adopting the fiber architecture to improve reconciliation, React is now focusing on compilation improvements to optimize performance and reduce bundle sizes. There is an interesting story unfolding, as all major framework creators and contributors have come together to discuss integrating signals into ECMAScript. Just like a sync await and promises, signals could become a shared feature enabling common tools like dependency graph visualization and debugging across different frameworks. Are signals truly the panacea? Will React give in and join the others? I don't know how frameworks will evolve, but I do know that it's up to us to prioritize user experience in the reactivity equation.